before I introduce our speaker tonight. I do want to invite you after the program to a wonderful dessert reception, compliments of our famous chef, Jude Martin, and also to the book signing with our author. Um, I'd also like to tell you about next week's program. Um, you may have heard this gentleman here before, uh, Anthony Amore, who is the chief of security for Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, um, is going to be here to talk about art at Art Heist. And the title of the talk is The Woman Who Stole Vermeer. And if you've heard him before, you know he's excellent, and it was in a, it's going to be a very delightful evening, as is tonight. Um, tonight's program is sponsored by Friends of Barnesville Harbor, and um, our friend Avery Revere is here tonight. Avery, thank you. So since the start of the millennium, Don Wilding has been telling stories of Cape Cod outer beach history. An award Award-winning writer and editor for Massachusetts newspapers for 35 years, Don has contributed the Shore Lore History column for the Cape Codder newspaper of Orleans. He is the author of Shipwrecks of Cape Cod, Stories of Tragedy and Triumph, which we have on sale tonight, and two other books, Henry Beston's Cape Cod, How the Outermost House Inspired a National Seashore, and A Brief History of East Ham on the Outer Beach of Cape Cod. Don is also a tour guide and a lecturer and has taught local history classes for adults on the Outer Cape. I'm very pleased to present tonight Don Wilding. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, how are we all doing? You all survived uh, okay? You, I, was, I was really afraid we weren't going to be here tonight with the way they were talking a few days ago. Uh, but that weather that we, we feared, that's what uh, a lot of these guys were, encounter, were encountering on the, on the beach. Uh, more of the winter variety, though, than the summertime hurricane variety. Um, the shipwrecks of Cape Cod, uh, how many, anybody have an idea of how many there were? 3,000 plus, that's correct. That's a lot of shipwrecks. And that's also, a lot of this happened before there was a Cape Cod canal. Um, let's, and this is not working. <laughs> Well, it was working before. Uh, oh. oh, well. Have to do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> Press the computer button. Uh, so, anyway, as we said, yes, 3,000 plus shipwrecks uh, between, the, between 16 and 20. 1626 and the mid-20th century. Uh, that whole solitary 40-mile stretch of beach saw 3,000-plus uh, wrecks. It's been said that if all of those wrecks could be raised, you could walk from Provincetown to Chatham without getting your feet wet. Imagine that, uh, just if you brought them all up. And oddly enough, uh, out of Europe, this all started with European settlers, of course. And the Mayflower actually came very, very close to becoming uh, the first shipwreck because of, uh, see now that works. Um, the Mayflower, when uh, she was coming across the Atlantic, way off course, as a lot of us know, uh, and spotted land at East Ham, they knew they were way off course from where they wanted to be. So they started to head south and encountered Pollock Rip and all these nasty shoals down around Chatham. So they simply turned around and went back up and, har and anchored in Provincetown Harbor and that's where their adventure began. But this area here, the Mayflower almost wrecked and many other, many other ships would, uh, 
would meet their end, there it goes, uh, over the years. And it wasn't too much longer that right in that same area was the wreck of the Sparrowhawk in 1626. Uh, this was, this was, the ship was following a similar uh, pattern to the Mayflower. Uh, coming from England, settlers going to the Virginia colony uh, and blown off course. Uh, the only problem with the Sparrowhawk was it stranded in uh, the entrance to Pleasant Bay, which was, uh, you know, their misfortune. Uh, this was in December of 1626, and when the Sparrowhawk landed, uh, it kind of crashed into the sandbar, and that's what a lot of these ships did. Um, and they were in, it was in pretty bad shape, and it needed to be fixed before they were going to go anywhere. And long story short, they came out, they were going to fix things, and they saw natives approaching them. And they had heard the stories and everything. And uh, as the natives approached them, they were very shocked when one of them uh, said in English, you govern with Governor Bradford's men. So they, at this point... They brokered a deal first with them to, for them to help repair the ship. Well, as soon as they repaired the ship, there was another storm and it got damaged again. So they had to, uh, from there, they were taken to, to uh, Plymouth, spent the winter there, and then eventually uh, went down to Virginia afterwards. The Somerset uh, happened in November of 1778. Uh, the Somerset was uh, basically a terror to anyone living on the uh, East Coast during the American Revolution. Especially it's mentioned in the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, but it also was a terror to the people of Provincetown. Captain used to send his chaplain ashore. Uh, where that's when they weren't taking whatever they wanted from the people of Provincetown. Uh, the chaplain would go ashore and preach about uh, about the evils of, of uh, resisting the king's rule and things like that. So the people in Provincetown weren't too fond of everything that was going on with the Somerset. Well, on the night of November 2nd, a big storm hits, and the Somerset is in pursuit of a French vessel off of the back shore. And it's chasing it, and it's not looking good all of a sudden for the Somerset because uh, it got caught up in this storm, and it stranded. It, uh, it hit the bar, as they would say. Now, when you hit the bar, it's, a, uh, it's, more than just, it's more than just getting stuck in the sand. When, you're, when your ship hits a sandbar, it's like a crash. You're just crashing into it, and it, and it would mess everything up. So the, the structure of the, the ship starts to fall apart, and that's what happened here with the Somerset. This is a big storm. Uh, the Somerset hits the bar, and everybody on board is, is rattled. In fact, it killed 20 men in the 480-man crew. And the next morning, when things cleared up, everybody was still so rattled aboard the Somerset, the men from Provincetown and Truro, who were watching this from High Pole Hill the night before, uh, which is where the monument is now, just came right down, walked out at low tide, went on board the Somerset, took everybody prisoner, and marched them to Boston. And they used the captain in a prisoner exchange. So that's just a, uh, a short look back at those, uh, those two ships. The Sparrowhawk's remains were recovered again in 1863. They are now in Plymouth. And the Somerset's remains were exposed again in 1886, then again in 1973, and then again in 2012. So they, they quickly are, are covered up again, though, by the elements. Um, some of the timbers from both of these ships actually became walking canes for people here on the Cape, and they were circulating around the Cape for a good many years after uh, these disasters. Um, so the Somerset was the last, last time it came up, it's in 2012. If you ever walk out in Provincetown on what they call Snail Road through the dunes, if you walk all the way to the ocean, past the Euphoria Dune Shack, and then you turn left, it's, uh, it's a short distance up the beach there, but most of the time it's buried. 
So with this need for aid, with all these shipwrecks, it became uh, pretty evident even in the uh, 1700s that it, something needed to be done. And uh, Donald McMillan of Provincetown actually noted that Benjamin Franklin was the first to recognize the dangers uh, in these waters off of Cape Cod. And through his efforts, uh, that led to the first lighthouse being built, Highland Light, on Cape Cod in 1797. That, of course, has been uh, restructured on two other occasions. And, of course, there were several other uh, lighthouses that followed. Well, this wasn't going to be enough because you had disasters like this happening. Uh, it was known as the Truro Gale, or many people call it the October Gale, of 1841. And the... Uh, the loss in this storm was the most serious calamity that ever visited the town of Truro. Um, 57 men from Truro died at sea during that one storm. They were out fishing various places in the ocean, caught up in this monstrous storm. And that claimed 57 lives from Truro. Uh, 40 vessels ran aground all along Cape Cod's outer beach. And 50 bodies were also found along the beach after that storm. Dennis, the town of Dennis, lost 26 men. 10 men from Yarmouth died. And 18 vessels from Harwich were also wrecked. Uh, there's a monument in the graveyard of the, um, of the Truro uh, Meeting House. The church, it's off to the, um, it's on the base side in Truro. Uh, off of Route 6, and this, this, old, this monument pays tribute to the 57 men of Truro that were lost. You've all heard the term wash ashores, right? How many of you are wash ashores? Yeah, quite a few of you, me too. Well, anyway, some wash ashores really did wash ashore. <laughs> People did, many, and also non-people, I'll get to that in a moment. But this case, uh, I, wrote this, I wrote about this in my book, A Brief History of East Ham, uh, four years ago. There was a uh, British brig called the Margaret, and it stranded on uh, Nauset Beach in April of 1852. So when that happened, uh, there weren't, mostly volunteers were the ones handling this kind of stuff, and a fellow named Freeman Doan Mayo was out on the beach looking for anybody that may have survived uh, this storm. Well, he did find somebody. It was a young fellow named John Fulcher. He was all of 14 years old. He was, a, uh, he was serving as an apprentice aboard the Margaret. And he apparently was the only one left alive. And he was up in the masts. He climbed up into the rigging. And that's what a lot of uh, men on board ships would do. When, uh, when the ship hit the sandbar and the ship would start breaking and sometimes taking on water, waves would be pounding it, the only place they could really go was to start climbing up in the rigging and hope someone would come along and help them out and save them. Well, that was the case from, for young John Fulcher. Um, Mr. Mayo came along, saw him up there, rescued him, brought him back to his house in East Ham. He lived there with Mayo, and then again, then with two other families over the next several years uh, before he became an adult, and then he eventually became a U.S. citizen, later owned farmland, and of course, started his own family. And then there were many more Fulchers after that. They're still there today. There are still Fulchers on the Outer Cape, descended from John Fulcher. And a couple of generations in, they would refer to the old McDonald song when they talked about the Fulchers. You know, the old refrain goes, old John Fulcher came ashore, E-I-E-I-O, here a Fulcher, there a Fulcher, everywhere a Fulcher, Fulcher. Obed, Obed Fulcher had a farm. He was next one of the next uh, descendants. Well, it wasn't always people. In this case, uh, 1854... There was a large uh, unknown brig that was uh, in trouble off of uh, Highland Light. And it's, it's getting tossed around in the ocean. And eventually, this, uh, unfortunately for this ship, it was uh, 
ended up in Cape Cod Bay and then blown right across the bay and eventually hit, struck the rocks at Situate, killed all seven men on board. The one survivor? Yeah, a pig. Uh, <laughs> what happened was as they were going, uh, as it was rocking around off of Highland Light, a lot of things started falling into the ocean. Well, one of them was this crate, and inside the crate was the pig. And the pig broke out of the crate while it was in the water and somehow managed to swim ashore a good mile. Now, you wouldn't think of pigs as good swimmers, but they are. And this one somehow got to shore exhausted, but he gets up, waddles his way up the beach a little ways, and somebody finds him and took him home. And it was said he grew to be a big and lusty porker. And if we could have talked, we would have known what the name of the ship was. So at this point, there's not much in the way of people doing rescues. We had uh, people like Mr. Mayo, who were volunteers, and you also had people in the Massachusetts Humane Society. They were actually in the business of shipwrecks back then. And this was in the, from the mid-1700s. Uh, they had these little huts along Cape Cod's outer beach which a lot of them ended up becoming halfway houses for the life-saving service and the Coast Guard later on. But inside these, these were just, uh, they were manned by volunteers, basically. They would come, and whenever the need was there for a shipwreck, they would, uh, they would end up getting a surf boat out or whatever equipment they could use. But this wasn't terribly effective. They did save some people, but the need was just too great. So after the Civil War, measures had finally been taken to start uh, through the, under the umbrella of the Treasury Department was the um, United States Life Saving Service. And this in 1915 eventually was folded into the US Coast Guard. So the Life Saving Service had ended up having stations everywhere, all over the country. Well, here on Cape Cod, they started out with nine in 1872. They built them very quickly. 1872, they had nine stations. It grew to 13 before the end of the century. And eventually, as things got better uh, with, um, with the Cape Cod Canal being built and technology improving, there was not a need, as much of a need for as many stations uh, when it finally became the Coast Guard. So the Life Saving Service was overseen by uh, its first superintendent. His name was Sumner Kimball. Kimball was, um, he oversaw the merger later on. And this guy was really great with dealing with bureaucratic type stuff and going to Congress and getting money. He was the first one to get a pension from the Life Saving Service. And he was, uh, he was the one that was able to get uh, all this funding that was necessary because he hired a, a writer named William O'Connor. Guy was really good when it came to, as a wordsmith. He, uh, O'Connor would exaggerate the facts from the keeper's reports, and, but he'd keep the facts the facts. You know, that 10, 10 or 12 foot wave became a 20 foot wave, you know, whatever he needed to do. And he'd send the reports to Congress, and when it came time for appropriations, Kimball got his money. So this helped to establish all of these um, different stations. Now this shows, this is 1902, and it shows, here we go. And it shows uh, all the, these little dots out in the water are the, are the shipwrecks even then. So that just show, goes to show you how many there were. Um, and that's just what they knew about. And the um, shipwrecks at this point, I mean the uh, stations, I'm sorry, started at Wood End in Provincetown. You also had Race Point. Peaked Hill Bars, one of the most treacherous areas along Cape Cod. Um, and you can see up there, there's quite a crowd of shipwrecks around that area. Um, it was just some very treacherous sandbars that were right off of Provincetown. Um, High Head in Truro, uh, Highland Light, uh, right next to Highland Light, there was one at what's now Coast Guard Beach in uh, Truro. And at Boston Beach, you had Pamet River. 
And then going a little bit further down, Cahoon Hollow in uh, Wellfleet. You probably know what that is now. Anybody? The Beachcomber, correct. Uh, the Beachcomber nightclub now. Um, Nauset is not the Coast Guard station that you see there now. That was built in the 1930s. This um, Nauset's uh, station was actually about 300 yards or so out at sea from what's there now. So that gives you an idea of how much things have changed. But that first station uh, was, and even that station from the, in the late 1800s and 19, early 1900s was moved a couple of times because of erosion issues. Uh, Orleans was right about uh, at the location where the Sparrowhawks stranded. And then the Old Harbor Life Saving Station, I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Uh, that was in North Chatham, Chatham, right near Chatham Light, and then the two on Monomoy. And again, on Monomoy, you see in a lot of uh, wrecks as well. So, and the way things were at the Life Saving Service stations, uh, Dennis Noble summed it up pretty well. He said, life at a station can be summed up very quickly, or simply, hours and hours of boring routine, with always a chance for minutes of sheer terror. And that's what happened with a lot of these places. The surfmen, who were, uh, each station had uh, anywhere from seven to nine surfmen. And these were the guys that they sent out uh, there was a keeper who was in charge. He was like the captain. And then they'd have uh, these surfmen ranked one through nine. Uh, if you were number one, you had a lot of experience and you were second in command. If you were number nine, you were probably a fisherman or a farmer last week. That's how uh, it, you were not the experienced one. They would be sent out on patrol every night between August and June. In July... Not so much. There wasn't as much of a need. Unless, of course, you know, you had a horrible storm like Henri coming in. Uh, in this uh, particular instance, though, during the, uh, during the winter months especially, this is when they would go out dressed in uh, a lot of times in what they called oil skins. And they sometimes had a lantern. And they also carried uh, some various equipment. Um, and they would check in at these halfway houses. And these kind of look like the old Humane Society huts. Um, and they were, kind of, they were tucked in between each of the stations. Say you were going north from Nauset. You would go to this halfway house and you, you would meet up with somebody from the Cahoon's Hollow Station. They would leave these tokens behind to indicate that their patrol had been done. And sometimes they would also stop in there. That's where they'd go in and warm up and maybe drink some coffee or a nip or whatever uh, to, to, uh, before they had to go back and walk. They would walk uh, several miles on one of their patrols. And it was not a pleasant job. When they were out there, if they saw a ship in distress, which they sometimes did, they pulled out what they called a costume flare. This is the same kind of thing you might use at a roadside when you're disabled. Uh, <clears throat> the costume flare would be lit. This would indicate to the, to the men on board the ship, the wrecked ship, who are some maybe up in the rigging, uh, that helps on the way. And also it was a, an indication to the station who had a man on watch in the tower that, hey, get down here. We need, we need assistance. We need, a res we need to do a rescue. They would break out what they call the apparatus cart. This would be filled with all kinds of different equipment that would help them uh, with, the, uh, with the rescue. Of course, they had a surf boat. This was used usually when, uh, when there was no, when you, when you could get out there, when the, when the conditions were not too bad, when they were somewhat manageable. Um, and this, this is actually old footage from over 100 years ago from the Life Saving Service, uh, showing them getting into the surf boat and heading out into the ocean. And they would have to go out. The ship could be only a couple of hundred yards away. It could be several hundred yards away. It could be even a mile away. That's how, how varied it was with all of these uh, different uh, 
you know, sandbars off of the coast because also the sandbars are constantly changing too. So that makes navigation very difficult. If uh, they couldn't use the surf boat, they used something called a breeches buoy. Maybe you've seen this up at uh, Provincetown at Race Point uh, at the Old Harbor Station Museum up there. Uh, during the summer months, they have these breeches buoy demonstrations. This was the creation of sort of a zip line between the beach and the, shi and the ship itself. They would go out with all of this equipment. They had a small cannon in a large box of rope that measured about 500 yards worth of rope. <clears throat> Inside the cannon was a projectile tied to this rope. They would fire this projectile over the ship's mast, hopefully that somebody on board was in good enough shape to tie it and fasten it, and that created this zip line between, between ship and shore. And it also had sort of a pair of pants, short pants on it, that you would uh, step into. And that was like, you know, you were getting a ride back to, uh, back to shore. And that's what they would do. They would, they would, uh, they would just zip, be uh, pulled back to shore. And it was, it was hard, it was tough, and they're going right above the waves, so this is not an easy thing to do. But it did save a lot of lives. So now we're at 1872. This is Christmas, right around Christmas of 1872. And they're finally got the life-saving service going. And in Truro, or in Truro and Provincetown, they get hit with two shipwrecks in one night. This one, the Francis, happened at what's now head of the Meadow Beach in Truro. And this was a bark, a German bark, it was referred to. It was a crew of 20. Everybody survived except the captain. He only died because of illness. He was already sick. And this ship was carrying a lot of sugar. And with this wreck, it provided an awful lot of sugar for the people in Truro. Uh, because whenever there was a wreck, uh, there, people weren't so much moon cussers and trying to cause the wrecks. It was more of a, a case of just um, salvaging whatever they could, wreckers, if you will. And that's, that was the case with this. It could be sugar, it could be anything. It could be wood, it could be booze, you name it. But in this case, it was sugar. Well, in this case, there was also no life-saving service station yet in this particular area at Highland. And they had a keeper, Edwin Worthen. He had just been appointed. And no crew and no station. So he had to go out and do things the old-fashioned way. He had to recruit volunteers in a snowstorm, then marched them all across to the bayside where they dug up an old uh, whaling surf boat, pushed it across an icy pond, then threw the snow to the beach, and they used it to do this rescue for the uh, Francis. They got all 20 men off. Uh, unfortunately, the captain, uh, Wilhelm Kortling, was taken to the Highland House, and he died shortly afterwards because of his illness. And Worthen took that pretty hard. Uh, that was always the case. Uh, whenever you lost somebody on your watch, it was, pretty, uh, it was pretty disturbing, and they took it very hard. He was tending to this captain's grave, uh, Edwin Worthen was, uh, for the next 35 years uh, on a regular basis. The remains of the Francis actually still come up every now and then at head of the Meadow Beach at low tide. Well, the Peruvian was not as fortunate. This ship was also carrying sugar and rubber and block tin from India to Boston. And this one hit about a mile offshore, off those Peacot Hill bars in Provincetown. And all 22 men on board died, including the captain, Zena Vanna. He was 28 years old. He had been at sea since he was a teenager. This was his final voyage. Vanna was on his final voyage, and he, was, he had promised his fiancée that this was it. He, you know, she was waiting for him. And she found out that he wasn't coming back by looking at the paper and seeing that screaming uh, giant black cruel headline that said, Ship Peruvian goes down off Cape Cod, all hands are lost. The Jason in Truro. 1893, this had to be one of the 
worst uh, of the uh, disasters uh, that happened. December 5th, 1893, it was right near the Pamet River Station. 25 out of 26 men died aboard this. Uh, and they didn't, basically didn't have a chance. They had been at sea for 10 months, uh, sailing with uh, 10,000 bales of jute from India. This is used to make fabric. Well, the bales, and they had just survived a cyclone in the Indian Ocean. The bales actually kind of came in handy here because everybody had climbed up into the masts when this ship struck and it was falling apart. And they thought they were gonna be rescued. They were actually optimistic. And then before, right before the lifesavers could get out there, the, the masts gave way. Everybody fell into the water and they, they all perished except for one man who fell in the water before, before uh, he had a chance to do anything, and that was Sam Evans. He ended up watching all of his shipmates dying when, they, when the mizzen mast fell. But Evans ended up, uh, he's barely dressed, he, he washes up on the beach, and he's clutching this bale of jute, and that's what saved his life. And he was very quickly uh, recovered by one of the lifesavers and brought back to the station. And this is him the next day. And you can see in the, uh, in the background there, you can see the ship still sitting there. And he's wearing this uh, cork uh, life preserver. And he, uh, he goes back to England uh, soon after that. And his father writes this thankful letter to the life-saving service. Uh, it's probable that he'll be sailing again from England in February. I trust on a more favorable voyage. Well, he did go off on another voyage, and he did not come back. Not because of a shipwreck. He fell out of his bunk and broke his neck. I mentioned the old harbor life-saving station earlier. Um, it's now in Provincetown. It, um, it was originally in Chatham, and it wasn't one of the original stations. It was built there because uh, in, after the December 1896 wreck of the Calvin B. Orcutt, uh, the Orcutt wreck there, and uh, it was too far away from the two closest stations, so they felt they had to build another station after the wreck of the Orcutt. Um, <clears throat> Eventually, it only took a few months, a couple of months, to recommend another station be built, and that's when they built the Old Harbor Life-Saving Station in, on North Beach in Chatham. Um, you see the, right between those two stations, there just wasn't enough, uh, enough coverage for that area. Well, this is it in 1977. It was... Um, you see it up there, and when it was first put up in, in the uh, late 1800s, in 1897, it was, uh, had 600 feet of sand between the front of the building and, uh, and the ocean, the high water mark. And this was it in 1977, right before it was moved. They ended up moving it in November of 77, it's Thanksgiving weekend, and they cut it up in a few pieces and put it on a barge, and they floated the whole station up to Provincetown. They had found a location that, let's put it up here at Race Point. There's no erosion issues up here. So they put it up there. Uh, they were going to put it up there. They had a foundation built, but when it got up to Provincetown, they discovered, oh, it's not going to fit right. This foundation is not adequate. So the station sat in Provincetown Harbor for the winter of 1977-78. Yes, that's the blizzard of 78 year. And it sat there in the harbor during the blizzard. Um, it actually survived, took a bit of a beating, but it was okay, and eventually the next year it was put out at Race Point. Um, but also with the, uh, from the wreck of the ore cut, the anchor is actually, you can, uh, still, you can see it now in Mystic, Connecticut. At, um, at, in one of the town squares in Mystic. It's on display there. They've actually, re the, the Museum of Mystic Seaport actually helped restore that. This is not in my book. This is my next project, actually. The Portland Gale of 1898. 
Um, some of you may be familiar with this storm. It was uh, pretty well known. I was going to include it in the shipwrecks book, but then it took on legs of its own. There's just too much in this one story. Uh, so it's, it's my next project. I'm already discussing it with the publisher on how we're going to do this. It was uh, the Portland Gale of 1898 happened in, on Thanksgiving weekend in, uh, of that year. And it was, a, it was a storm that claimed 456 lives at sea between Maine and New Jersey over that weekend. The Portland was a steamer, a paddle steamer, that ventured out from Boston that night against orders, carrying 192 passengers. None of them survived because the Portland, uh, as it went up the coast along the North Shore, that's when the storm uh, got was a lot worse than they had figured. And it was blown out to sea and many lives, this was an earlier edition of the Boston Globe, but this map kind of shows you uh, how it went. They left Boston at seven o'clock that Saturday night and they were supposed to go to Portland, but it's not clear what happened, but it was thought to have uh, run into some kind of trouble. It was getting battered by the storm, and it's and these kind of steamers, it wasn't. They, they didn't do too much uh, at sea afterwards with these steamers. They just weren't effective, and the Portland was blown out to sea and eventually down close to Provincetown. It was eventually it went down. Uh, not, how it went down is not clear, but it did go down over uh, Stillwagon Bank area, and they did eventually uh, discover its ruins. Hollis Blanchard was the captain. He was the one that defied the orders. Um, as they, uh, after the, what happened on, the, the, uh, on November 27th, the next morning is when it went down, um, Bodies began washing ashore on Cape Cod's outer beaches. There was 38 bodies that ended up being recovered. Uh, many of the bodies from the Portland and the other disasters at sea were never recovered. Some, a lot of them came ashore at Nauset, the East Ham Orleans area. Uh, people were coming from out of town, from Boston and Maine, trying to find out what had happened to their loved ones. And they were, they were starting to find them washing in uh, on the beaches. Very stressful on the life-saving service, too. There was a gentleman who wrote to me uh, shortly after I wrote this story about the Portland a few years ago, and he, and he said, my great-grandmother talked about the Portland when I was young. And she talked about the bodies found on the beach in East Ham and how the funeral home on Bridge Road in South East Ham was full. The ground was frozen, and it was, of course, covered with snow. It was a huge, monstrous blizzard. So they, they kept a lot of bodies in the barn uh, next door. That's how tough things had gotten there. And Provincetown Harbor, too, filled up with shipwrecks. There were a couple of dozen ships that piled up in the West End, uh, right about where the Mayflower had originally anchored. And this was before the, um, uh, you had the uh, breaker, you know, the stone structure there across uh, Provincetown Harbor. So it was, uh, it, it grew to be, it was quite a mess, particularly with the Lester Lewis and Jordan L. Mott. There was a woman who saw the men, the frozen bodies in the Jordan Mott's rigging, and she saw them being cut down from the rigging by the life-saving service. And then she said from that time on, she kept the shades drawn on every window that faced the harbor. The Monomoy disaster happened March 17, 1902. If you've ever been down to Chatham Light, there's this monument that's right to, uh, if you're looking at the lighthouse, uh, to the right-hand side, there's a very tall monument. And it's, uh, it's called the William Mack Memorial. And this is a uh, pays tribute to the men that were lost at this uh, disaster uh, that involved two barges, the Wadena and the Fitzpatrick. And they stranded off of Monomoy Point during this storm. And uh, the Wadena, they, there, was, there was full of workers on coal barges. And they were taking this whole thing pretty lightly. And 
And they went to bed that night, partying it up, playing cards while the storm is raging. And then the next morning, they're panicking, and they fly the uh, distress signal. So whenever that happened, you know what they always say about the life-saving service and the Coast Guard? You have to go out, but you don't have to come back. And that's what happened here. They went out, and most of them did not return. Um, Marshall Eldridge was the keeper and six crew members had to go out and do the rescue because they were summoned to go out. So they took the surf boat out to the Wadena. They reached the barge, and the men start panicking, these, these workers. We're all lost, and the, you know, the keeper tells them, sit down, you fool, or you're going to be lost. And he's telling his Seth Ellis, one of his surfmen, uh, bat this guy in the head if you have to, but get him down somehow, you know, and it didn't help because uh, on the return journey, a wave hits the, su hits the boat, and then eventually one man after another starts dropping out. The only man left is Seth Ellis after a while. Everybody else had been lost overboard, and Ellis himself is in, in great trouble. He's, um, he looks up, sees a dory coming, Elmer Mayo, who had been aboard the Fitzpatrick, is coming, and he, he gets to Ellis, pulls him to the dory, they get ashore, they're recognized as heroes. Mayo becomes known as the hero of Monomoy, gets all kinds of medals from uh, the Humane Society and, and other organizations. They had a big fundraiser with both men. They raised over $36,000 for the families that were lost in the uh, disaster, helped them build houses in Harwich and Chatham for them. And Ellis, too, was given, uh, given all kinds of awards and, and promoted to keep her at the Monomoy Station. But the uh, life-saving life service uh, determined in their report that they didn't have to, these men would have been fine had they stayed on board and just waited it out, but because they panicked and uh, they, were, they summoned the uh, life-saving service, they had to go and these men were doing their job. So they were recognized as heroes. Fast forward now to April 1915, big storm as usual. There's a tugboat called the Mars off of Provincetown in Truro. It's carrying three barges with it, the Colerain, the Tunnel Ridge, and the Mannheim. And eventually, the Mars has to cut them loose to salvage the tugboat, even. The barges are cut, and they end up stranding right in front of Highland Light on the beach. So the Tunnel Ridge and the Colerain are so badly damaged, they're not, it's not, it wasn't worth it to try to float them again. Uh, but the Mannheim sustained only minimal damage, and they eventually refloated it. This was, they had a huge bonfire on the beach with the remains of the other two barge, the other two barges. But one part of the coal rain did prove to be useful. They cut it in two and ran it up the cliff on skids, and it served a purpose for a number of years. It became the pro shop at Highland Links. So that was it uh, there. For, it was there at least until the, the 1950s. Uh, we've been, I've been trying to pinpoint it with the help of other people, and we can't quite seem to pinpoint when it disappeared. Quite a few houses have, uh, have changed up there. But it, was the, it is the deck house of a barge, complete with pilot house, bridge, and steering wheel was the description of it. This one, uh, I always found this to be one of the most fascinating wrecks that I've researched was the Castagna. Happened in February off of uh, Wellfleet. Not too far, just a little far south, just a little bit south of the Marconi site in Wellfleet. This was a, a storm with, uh, temperature was about 10 degrees, and the Castagna was a, an Italian ship that uh, hit, the, hit the sandbar and was just, it was just, uh, it was just a terrible scene uh, from what happened. The Castagna had come from, was down in South America, Montevideo, Uruguay, and it was carrying a load of guano. Yeah, this could have been, or must have been a real pleasant voyage, huh? Uh, it was going uh, from Uruguay in December, and it was headed to the, uh, and it was carrying also bullhorns, 
This is all for the process of making fertilizer. To the Bradley Fertilizer Company of Weymouth. I can't imagine this was a great place to work either. It was out on an island, and the workers not only worked there, they lived there as well. So this was their destination. The Castagna never made it. It stranded in, this, in these horrible conditions, high winds, frigid temperatures, and it's getting pelted by waves, which is freezing on contact with the ship. So imagine that. Imagine this, this uh, scene that happens. Uh, two stations were summoned to help out in the rescue. Cahoon's Hollow Station, this is early in the morning now, right, as the, right at dawn uh, from Wellfleet, and the Nauset Station from East Ham. They're both uh, sent up there, and they can't get on the beach, really. They have to do things at first from up top on the cliff because the beach is flooded. That's, that's a, that was a common problem along Cape Cod's outer beach with that cliff. Uh, a lot of times the beach just floods. So they had to kind of wait out the tide before they could get down on the beach to help things out. And two of the big players in this rescue ended up being uh, Lewis Collins, who had been a longtime surfman, and his son Bernie, who was all of 17 years old. Bernie always uh, would go with his father to a lot of the wrecks. And that little tyke right there, that's Bernie when he was a kid. So he would go with his dad to a lot of the wrecks beforehand. So he was involved in this rescue. They all had to, they go to the, uh, they go to the ship, they try at first to do a uh, breaches buoy rescue. Can't do it because when they shot the uh, projectile out there, there was nobody on board that was healthy enough to fasten it. So they knew they were gonna have to use the surf boat. Once they got out there, they get out to the, uh, to the boat, and uh, there's only a few guys that are even somewhat functional. There's a few that are up in the masts, frozen to death. They are completely frozen. They were described uh, as looking like mummies uh, up there, frozen mummies. And Bernie was, uh, he played a big part in this, young Bernie. He was dispatched to go up and cut these guys down out of the mast. But also, he had to first help out uh, the people that were still alive. One of them was the first mate. He was kind of crouched over the wheel box, holding on, and his hand was frozen to the spoke. Bernie had to cut the spoke with an ax to free him from it, and eventually they got him on shore, and the man died very quickly afterwards. Um, but also, uh, Bernie then had to climb up into the mast, cut these guys down who were frozen, and he said, he, he recalled this in an interview for Tales of Cape Cod in 1977, uh, how one of the men fell and hit the deck, and he was frozen solid. He said his arm broke off like a piece of glass. Pretty, pretty vivid description and a little hard to believe, but still. That was Bernie's description. Uh, also, when he had that happen, that was bad enough. And Bernie himself suffered a great deal of frostbite. It affected him for the rest of his life. Um, he also uh, eventually uh, became a selectman in East Ham, the Collins family. If you ever go through the rotary going into East Ham, on the right-hand side, you see Collins Cove. You see that old shucking house and you see those cottage, cottages there. That was built, I think it was in the 20s or 30s by Bernie and his father, Lewis. So that's, that's the same family. And anyway, Bernie ended up having to be taken back to the Coast Guard station. He was uh, pretty, pretty badly frozen himself uh, from frostbite. But also the captain of the Castagna was also up in the mast he was still alive, but he fell as the boat was getting rocked by the waves. He hits his head on the deck and is then swept overboard almost instantaneously by a wave. So that all happened. His body was not recovered for another year and a half. Pretty much fro half frozen and pretty well intact. But because he had been swept overboard, 
and then probably buried in the sand, and they found him a year and a half later in Nauset Marsh, 10 miles away. That just shows you how powerful and, uh, the ocean can be. Um, so a lot of the men, too, aboard the Castania, the ones that survived, they went to Boston. They had to under, some of them had to undergo amputations. It was a pretty uh, overall horrific scene. Um, but again, here we go with more wash ashores, more animals. They went into the cabin afterwards to recover all kinds of things, uh, particularly any papers they might find. And they found a canary in a cage, still singing. This is where everybody should have gone, was into the cabin. They would have been fine. Uh, <clears throat> the canary, the canary died very quickly, though. And this cat, who they named Castagna, he was brought to the Marconi station and lived a, uh, quite a long life there and is said to have started a long line of stray cats on the Outer Cape. So he was, uh, Castagna was one of, actually many cats were, uh, found new homes here on Cape Cod because they were on board ships, ships that wrecked. And they were, they were among the survivors. Uh, I can mention Henry Beston a little bit. Uh, he was, uh, his book, The Outermost House, a uh, very influential book. But very quickly, I'll just mention that while Beston was on the beach, he became very friendly with the Coast Guardsmen, particularly of the Nauset Station. And he had his own uniform and everything that they'd given him. And he described a lot of shipwrecks uh, while he was staying at the forecastle, his house on the outer beach. And he became friendly with the Coast Guardsmen. And in 1923, five years before he wrote The Outermost House, he wrote a magazine article about the Coast Guardsmen of the outer beach. It was called The Wardens of Cape Cod. And even in this, he, did all, he made all kinds of great descriptions, uh, like he did uh, of uh, the Montclair, which happened in 1928, and he describes it very vividly in the outermost house. And this, uh, five men drowned aboard the Montclair, March of 1927, off of Nauset Beach. And there was a problem there because Nauset's, uh, the Orleans station was being shut down, and they had only three people on duty. So that's why five men drowned, only two were actually saved from uh, this, this vessel, the Montclair, which was carrying a load of wood uh, heading for New York. These were the two survivors uh, shown up here, and they ended up fully staffing the Orleans station again after that. Um, one of them, Nathan Baggs, he, uh, he went back to Nova Scotia, and Years later, he's reading National Geographic magazine, this is around 1962, and he sees this feature story on the Cape Cod National Seashore. And he sees a, a picture of the wreck of the Montclair that he was aboard, and there's kids jumping off of it. And he takes, he sees that, he says, I gotta go back. And he did a few years later, and he actually saw some of the people that, that helped him with the rescue from the Montclair that night. Uh, so it, he also admitted that he was offered a job with the Coast Guard and he wishes he had taken it. But he, uh, but they did end up having to reopen that, they did restaff that station later on in the year. I'm gonna jump ahead a little to 1962. I mentioned the breaches buoy uh, quite a bit here and they were, in the, they were pretty much retiring that uh, when you got into the 1940s and 1950s, it was used sparingly. And in 1962, in January, that was the last time they actually used it, uh, was rescuing the seven-man crew of the fishing vessel Margaret Rose, carrying five tons of halibut. This was right off of Wood End in Provincetown. And who was running that operation with uh, the breaches buoy? None other than Bernie Weber of the Pendleton fame. Um, you might notice I don't talk about the Pendleton and the Witta because they've been done. So I left them out on, on my book because uh, I don't want to repeat things. But with uh, Bernie Weber, he was basically had a crew of rookies here in this particular uh, instance. And so he got the breaches buoy, which had been in storage 
at the Cape Cod Canal Coast Guard Station in Sandwich. And they got it out and they used it again. And Bernie was the only one that really knew what he was doing with it. And he said he got a bunch of green men and they, they managed to uh, save everybody on board. And as luck would have it, our first shot was successful. And they never used it again, although they almost did in 1984. Now, during the 20th century, a lot of uh, freighters started also getting stuck in the sand. They weren't so much wrecks, but a lot of them got stuck, and they were almost wrecks sometimes. 1907, the Onondaga beached in Chatham. And then in 1984, some of you might remember this, in Orleans, the Eldia, this happened only about 100 feet from where the Sparrowhawk stranded so many years earlier, centuries earlier. And the Eldia, that was on March 30th, 1984, it was headed to Virginia, and it was got itself in trouble off of the beach there, and it was, it, things were pretty bad there for a while for them. The Coast Guard ended up having to use this uh, rescue helicopter that um, they, they were, they were kind of, you know, they didn't have a lot of time to operate here. Uh, they had to get the crew off before dark, and if the chopper couldn't get them and they had to abandon ship, they never would have found them in the water. Uh, they would have had some casualties there, and particularly they had 60 mile an hour winds, and the helicopter had to make three attempts using a basket. So they took eight men the first time, then 13, and then two, respectively. And the helicopter was also running out of fuel at this point. And if they hadn't gotten the 13 off during the second run, they thought they never would have gotten everybody off. So they were pretty fortunate uh, during this rescue. And two months, not even two months later, they finally refloated it uh, with some cable and tugboat uh, magic uh, and towed it through the Cape Cod Canal to Newport, Rhode Island. Well, it left its mark all right <laughs> because 30,000 people were reported to uh, have walked across the dunes to see the ship that following weekend, that first weekend. And that turned into some big money for Orleans because you don't usually have this many people going to the beach at the end of March, beginning of April. Well, that's what happened in Orleans. Uh, the merchants made out really well. Uh, East Ham's Noel Bile, the famous historian from East Ham, uh, he sold more than 20,000 postcards. I can remember Noel bragging about that to me. Uh, Joan Hart of the uh, Quahog Hollow in Orleans told uh, WBZ that she sold well over 3,000 Eldia coffee mugs. And over at the Land Ho, John Murphy, and incidentally at the Land Ho, one of their uh, owners the, is a descendant of Abbott Walker, who was the keeper of the um, Nauset station for many years. And uh, they actually have the Abbott Walker room there now. Uh, but John told the uh, Cape Codder that business was better than on a rainy Saturday in July. He said, those who ordered clam chowder found the plastic freighter floating atop the potatoes. And he says, I think everybody benefited from that. And he said, he, he said, except the poor fellow who owns that ship. So a lot of times you had to call on, whether it was the Humane Society, the Life Saving Service, the Coast Guard, uh, to, to the rescue in shipwrecks. A lot of people putting their lives on the line here. And that was something that Henry Beston really admired about them and something I admired too. This was a, this was a job and Beston admired them because uh, unlike he had served in World War I as an ambulance driver, and he saw the worst of the worst over there. But he really admired these men because they were putting their lives on the line, not to take lives, but to save lives. That really heartened him. And Earl Rich wrote in Cape Cod Echo, Echoes, what manner of men were these hardy specimens to have chosen the livelihood they did? They were, in my opinion, the last of a breed. Come hell or high water and with utter disregard for their own safety, the safety of a shipwrecked sailor clinging to the rigging of some stranded vessel came above all else to them. 
That brings the talk to a conclusion. Um, I've, I'm not doing too much in the way of lectures these days, folks, but I do, I'm out at the Cape Cod National Seashore every Saturday. I conduct walks, history walks, for the Harwich Conservation Trust and East Ham Conservation Foundation. And uh, these walks are, some are on the outermost house and some are on uh, storms, shipwrecks, and rescues. And we'll be doing both of them this Saturday. Shipwrecks at 10 a.m., outermost house at 1 p.m. And we will be doing this every Saturday, one or the other, or both, through November 27th. So we will be at it uh, outdoors more often than not. Uh, all the details are on my website, dwcapecod.com. I have business cards there, too, uh, for all that kind of information. I'm on all those social media channels, too, uh, right there. And... Oh yeah, I have books too. <laughs> they're right up here. Uh, they're available after uh, the program. And uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. Yes? It strikes me that while all of this is going on, going back to that first point you alluded to, this is a parallel story. This is the story of the Cape Cod Canal. That's right. To what extent is the funding for the canal project with all the politics that came from it? Well, it, it played a big part. I actually did include a chapter in that, on that, in the book, yes. Um, the Cape Cod Canal was, was really a big deal when it came to the end of the shipwrecks. But uh, because it, it started in 1914, 1915, and it was, the Cape Cod Canal was a private venture. August Belmont was the name of the businessman from New York. And he made a big deal about this. This was going to be a big uh, moneymaker and everything. And uh, it was going to end every, all the problems. Well, it didn't at first. Because Belmont, within, within uh, a few years, Belmont was looking to get out and sell the canal. He was not doing as well as he thought. The problem was, well, he was also charging tolls to ships going through. And with the canal, it was also not wide enough and it was not deep enough. So there were shipwrecks happening in the canal. So between the tolls and the shipwrecks happening in the canal, a lot of, a lot of ships uh, and captains just said, the heck with this, I'm going around, take my chances, you know, the way we did before. And, and he was not doing well with it, and he was trying to find a taker, and he finally found a taker in the U.S. government. And he sold it to the government during the 1920s. And they were the ones, and then finally during the New Deal, that's when all the money went into it and widened, uh, made deeper. And then the two bridges that we still have today were built. There was only, I think, one bridge, and it was a drawbridge kind of deal. Uh, that was before. So it was not, um, it, it wasn't until Belmont got rid of it, it was when it was, uh, when it became, and, and tolls weren't a problem anymore either. So because the government took care of it, it was the Army Corps of Engineers has been running it ever since. Um, so that's uh, kind of, uh, kind of the whole deal there. And then also between the canal and the improvements in technology, that's what led to the shipwrecks uh, they finally started closing a lot of the other stations. Uh, even before the 1930s, they had started to. But by the 30s and then the 40s, and now, now you look at it, I think there's only a couple of stations out there. There's one in Chatham and one in Provincetown, and I think that's it. Uh, but back then, yeah, they were all over the place. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, folks. I will. Uh, I will be over here. Um, and I understand there's there is a lovely dessert spread over in the other room too. So uh, please enjoy and thank you for coming. <laughs>